Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Really appreciate uh, everybody coming out tonight. Um, it, we have continued the lecture series uh, the uh, the first Thursday in the month, and tonight we're we're happy to have uh, Gene Diorio here uh, talking about the, uh, the Bank of Chester Valley, and uh, we are uh, excited to hear about that. Um, you know, banking is is uh, for some it, it's a complex and foreign language, and uh, you know, using the, using the banks today is uh, always in the news, and it's it's a complicated. But uh, it must have been interesting back when uh, you know the country was getting going in the financial institutions, and and Luke and Steele developing, and uh, as well the family interests and the need for uh, for banks. So it, tonight we're very interested to hear about the history of uh, of banking here in Coatesville, and uh, we want to welcome Gene Diorio back to to uh, hear about that. So thank you very much, Gene. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a little bit uh, different from the lectures uh, those of you who have been regular attendees have been expecting from me. Usually, it's been travel lectures with a procession of slides, with Sam helping me do it, and we've gone to England, Scotland. Italy, wherever. But tonight we're uh, not going to do pictures, we're just going to concentrate on local history. And I felt banking was something we should um, do. And yes, it's Chester Valley, but you know, as a sample of how quickly time moves on, I've had at least three people say, well, Gene, who was Chester Valley? You know, they seem to have forgotten. Well, of course, it was Chester Valley Bank. It was the National Bank of Chester Valley. Eventually it became Provident. Then when they merged with Pittsburgh, it became PNC. And then it was a new bank, Chester something or other. And then it was uh, Harleysville, and now it's first Niagara, uh, what had been this business. So it's amazing how quickly things are changing in this economy. Uh, but I think the briefest review of Coatesville's history should indicate quite clearly the basic importance of its business, industrial, and commercial interests. A major factor in the development of this region and its transformation from an agrarian to an industrial economy was the building in the 1790s of the Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike. It was America's first toll road and it provided an improved travel facility through the Great Chester Valley, a natural transportation corridor which bisects this county in an east-west direction. Land developers, then as now, alert to the commercial possibilities promised by new highways, began to acquire properties along the route of the turnpike. And by 1810, portions of the land owned by Moses Coates, Coates, of course, was the prominent local farmer for whom this community is named, and who incidentally lived just down the street in the Brandywine Mansion, which we now have as part of our Lucan's Industrial District, uh, part of his land was divided by a partner into building lots. And the Chester Valley Bank was placed on one of those lots. The turnpike, which eventually became designated as U.S. Route 30, became Coatesville's main street and of course it passed right in the front door of the bank. Now remember at that time, Coatesville was not yet a organized municipality. We were a village within the township. It wasn't until 1867 that the village of Coatesville and the village of Midway, which was our West End, joined to form the borough of Coatesville and become formally uh, a, a municipality. Now the presence of a major highway leading directly to Philadelphia, which of course was then America's largest city, the existence of several iron furnaces and forges in this region to supply pig iron and bar iron, plus the availability of an abundant supply of water power from the nearby Brandywine, and local labor force, these factors were undoubtedly prime considerations in the decision of Iron Master Isaac Pennock to establish a rolling mill in this valley. On land purchase from Moses Coates, the transfer document bears the date of July the 2nd, 1810, just 212 years ago this summer, Pennock built his Brandywine Ironworks and Nail Factory, thus launching Coatesville into the business for which it is primarily famous. Isaac Panic's son-in-law, Dr. Charles Lukens, took over management of this mill about 1816, and shortly thereafter began the manufacture of boilerplates, 
a key product decision which recognized the growing use of steam engines for both industrial and transportation purposes. To Dr. Lukens, I think, must go the credit for setting the course of the Lukens business into the manufacture of high quality plates for specialized uses. To this day, the foremost items in the plant's product line, which of course the plant is now ArcelorMittal. Dr. Lukens' work was continued and expanded by his widow, that truly remarkable woman, Rebecca Lukens, who assumed management of the ironworks after the death of her husband in 1825. In addition to Lukens, other ironworks flourished in the area during the early to mid 19th century. Among them, the Viaduct Mill of Steel and Worth, uh, the Valley Ironworks of Charles and Joseph Pennock, further up 82. And the names of several of these mill owners appear in the early records of the bank. With so much industrial development in this coastal area, it was inevitable that the business community would feel the need of a commercial bank <coughs> to provide financial services. Prior to the establishment of the Chester Valley Bank, there was only one incorporated bank in all of Chester County. Located in Westchester, founded in 1814, the Bank of Chester County stood almost alone for about 40 years. Its distance from Coatesville was an obvious and growing inconvenience. I mean, you could spend a whole day with your horse and buggy getting to Westchester and back to do banking. By the 1850s, local business leaders were clamoring for a hometown bank and successfully petitioned the Pennsylvania State Legislature for a local bank charter. The new bank, titled the Bank of Chester Valley, was formally chartered on April the 27th in 1857 and incorporated a few days later on May the 1st. This historic business stood as Coatesville's oldest banking establishment and the second oldest in Chester County. An organizational meeting of the new bank was held on May the 9th, 1857, with Dr. Jesse Coates, who was the son of Moses Coates, presiding. A committee consisting of Dr. Charles Houston, U.E. Steele, and W.B. Mendenhall was appointed to prepare the books and papers needed to start the bank and to receive stock subscriptions. The bank opened its books for subscriptions on June the 8th, 1857. Its minutes record that 301 persons subscribed that first day, taking a total of 577 shares. An additional 1,167 shares were sold the following day, June the 9th, indicating very strong public support and confidence in this new venture. Subscription sales continued until June the 20th, by which date all 3,000 of the authorized shares were taken and the stock books were closed. Subscribers were allowed to pay for their shares in installment. And by September the 22nd of 1857, the bank had received a total of $75,000 from stock sales. Come in, sir. Hi. By mid-September, the bank was also prepared to form a permanent organization, elect a board of directors, and select officers. Chosen as first president was Abram Gibbons, husband of Rebecca Lukens' oldest daughter, Martha, and a partner in the Brandywine Ironworks with his brother-in-law, Dr. Charles Houston. We brought up a large picture of Abram Gibbons for you to see. Uh, that used to hang in the bank, and many years ago, the bank graciously gave it to the Greystone Society, and we were very pleased to have this fine portrait of Mr. Gibbons. Mr. Gibbons served as president until 1882. He became so involved with a new career in banking that he eventually gave up his partnership in the ironworks and sold his interest in the business to his brother-in-law, Dr. Charles Houston. The minutes of the Chester Valley Bank, which I think constitute a superb historical document, indicate the new board acted promptly to make the necessary provisions to operate a bank. Procuring proper books and papers, including certificates of deposits and cashier's drafts, and seeking a suitable location in which to conduct the institution's business. Several off offers were received for land from public spirit citizens. The board eventually accepted the offer from Dr. Jesse Coates and his wife, Martha Coates, who was a sister, incidentally, of Rebecca Lukens. 
right on Main Street where the bank was and the bank remained on that site since its founding through several mergers and name changes, the latest being First Niagara and it functioned as a bank until it was closed uh, last year. Another important matter involved the engraving and printing of notes to be issued by the bank. The minutes of September the 22nd, 1857, record that a committee appointed for this purpose had, and I quote from the minutes, contracted with the firm of Bald, Causal and Company, banknote engravers of Philadelphia, to engrave two steel plates for printing notes. The committee further reported that it had contracted for the printing of $340,000 of notes distributed in five, 10, 20, 50, and $100 denominations. Now behind me on the mantelpiece are the, not notes themselves, but the preliminary uh, drafts for those, and I'll tell you more in detail. It's necessary at this point to recall and understand that prior to the passage of the National Banking Act in 1863, it was quite common and indeed general practice for local banks to issue their own notes. Although the federal government restricted metallic coinage to itself, the Founding Fathers made no provision in the Constitution for the issuance of paper money. Both the first and second banks of the United States were allowed to issue notes under their federal charters. But all hopes of creating a really viable central banking system in the United States were destroyed in the 1830s, when the continuation of the second bank became a major political issue, and under the very forceful opposition of President Andrew Jackson, its charter was allowed to lapse and was not renewed. Financial historians have generally regarded that act as a serious mistake, and certainly our financial and banking history in the next few decades is a study in chaos and confusion. In the absence of a central banking system and a strong federal currency functioning as a national circulating medium, the issuance of paper money by state and local banks became a very necessary substitution. It was hardly an ideal situation. A major weakness was the absence of uniformity in the value of banknotes. Some were considered as good as gold, or others were nearly worthless, depending upon the strength, or at least the perceived strength, of the issuing bank. By the late 1850s, there were close to 1,600 chartered banks in the United States, operating under the varying laws of 34 separate states. Banknotes differed in size and design, making recognition difficult and counterfeiting very easy. A teller's life was not an easy one in those days. And of course, circulation and acceptance were often limited to a relatively small geographical area. All of these factors in time decreased the general acceptability of banknotes and fed the demand for serious currency reform. Now back to the notes themselves, I wasn't able to find an entry in the Banks Minutes recording specific approval of note designs. But the Bolt Cause and Company did prepare proofs, and apparently they were readily accepted by the bank's board of directors. And the actual notes promptly printed and delivered. For on November the 6th, 1857, the board directed the president and cashier to sign and prepare for circulation a total of $60,000 in notes, in denominations of five, 10, and $20. Business at the Bank of Chester Valley appears to have been brisk. For on February the 1st, 1858, the board resolved to issue an additional $90,000 in note, this time including $50 $100 denominations, along with the fives and tens and twenties previously approved. Now the designs provided by the engraver for the Bank of Chester Valley are rather typical examples of 19th century banknotes. Indicated on the notes are the dollar denominations, the name of the issuing bank, its location, and lines for signatures of the bank's president and cashier. Also, such notes usually included a promise to pay the bearer on demand in gold or silver. The country then had a legal bimetallic standard. However, since coin was often scarce in many localities, note holders did not always have a choice between holding paper or specie. Obviously, it was to the advantage of the banks to have as many people as possible use their notes as cash balances and to have their notes in the widest circulation. Now, the bank notes were usually embellished with delicate 
finely detailed vignettes, and often featured portraits of state and national figures. The bank's notes had portraits of Henry Clay and President James Buchanan, uh, and they were on notice on the $100 notes. In 1864, the boards voted to uh, replace Buchanan's portrait with that of Abraham Lincoln. The largest illustrations were usually placed in the very centers of the notes. Sometimes they were generic drawings celebrating commerce, industry, and agriculture. And incidentally, the uh, splendid mural that's on the high wall of the bank uptown uh, was exactly uh, that sort of thing, a sort of apotheosis of Coatesville as the center of farm and industry, something which I hope is preserved. Sometimes, though, the notes and the illustrations on the notes depicted local scenes or local history. And in the case of the Chester Valley notes, two drawings of local scenes were used. Uh, two drawings that were to transcend their value as note decorations and become important records of this valley's life and industry in the 1850s. The first drawing that was used on the $5 and $100 note depicts the first railroad bridge, and that's the picture there. Uh, the building of the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad in the 1830s, the route that later became, of course, the main line of the Pennsylvania Railroad and is now owned by Amtrak, was a momentous event for Coatesville and the surrounding area, as it opened immense new commercial opportunities for the local mills. Rebecca Lukens had predicted the building of a high bridge over the Brandywine Gorge, and when others regarded it as an engineering impossibility. Happily, she lived to see it before she died in 1854. The second drawing, which was used only on the $10 notes, depicts the mill, the interior of the Lukens Brandywine Mill as it would have been known to Mr. Gibbons, Dr. Houston, and Rebecca herself. Looking closely, uh, and that's this drawing, of course, you will see the early rolling mill in the center with workmen handling the plates to and from the rolls. To the right is a furnace used, no doubt, to bring the iron bars to the proper temperature for rolling, and to the left, a primitive plate shearing operation. <clears throat> now, this illustration of Lucan's old mill is quite valuable as a rare record of early rolling mills. It served as the reference source for a rolling mill model that the Hagney Museum Delaware uh, uh, had made and made it from that drawing and then a few years ago happily Hagley gave it to us, the Greystone Society, and it's now on display in the front lobby. The old mill drawing became the better known of the two as it was used extensively by Lukens on letterheads, business cards, and other advertising purposes. These frame prints were made about 1900 from the original wash drawings and present the scenes in somewhat larger detail than you see on the notes. Both drawings are, so far as I know, the only known depiction of their subjects at that time. And their use on the Bank of Chester Valley's notes nicely combines Coatesville's banking, transportation, and industrial history. Impressive and handsome as they were, the Bank of Chester Valley's notes remained in circulation for only a few years. The need for currency reform was hastened by the oncoming of the Civil War. The besieged federal government became most anxious to create a safe and uniform banknote issue system and to provide a continuing market for the government's bonds, of course, to finance the war. On February the 25th, 1863, Congress passed the National Banking Act, and it became law. Under its provisions, state chartered banks could be reorganized as national banks. The Chester Valley's directors took prompt notice of the new federal legislation. On March the 16th, 1863, they resolved to obtain the consent of the stockholders of the bank to reorganize the bank under the National Banking Act. Quote from the minutes, if they deemed it expedient. More urgent concerns soon intervened, however, as in late June of 1863, General Lee's army moved into Northern Virginia, crossed Maryland, and entered Pennsylvania. One can imagine the fear and apprehension that must have spread through this valley with the Confederate army actually north of the Mason and Dixon line. The minutes for the June 29th board meeting cogently note that President Gibbons was absent as he was busy superintending the removal of coin and other valuables 
from the bank for safekeeping. In view of the threatened invasion of Chester County, the coin of the bank was taken to the vaults of the Bank of New York, and valuable securities consisting of stocks, bonds, government loan certificates, plates, unsigned notes, taken to a bank in Philadelphia. A notion was made on June the 29th to appoint James Penrose, Nathan Baker, and Dr. Charles Houston, who no doubt was thinking of the probable destruction of his ironworks if the Confederates got to Coatesville. A committee to act in cooperation with the officers of the bank, and again I quote, in case they deemed it necessary to destroy the circulation of the signed notes of the bank which might be on hand, end of quote. On the memorable morning of July the 1st, 1863, as the massive armies of the North and South were forming for the first of three days battle at Gettysburg, the bank's committee decided the time had come to destroy the bank's notes. And a few days later, with the, bank, with the battle firmly decided, the committee reported to the board that it had burned signed notes that morning to the amount of $144,940. The board then voted to burn another $60 worth of notes at that meeting to make an even $145,000. <laughs> a week later, on July the 13th, 1863, the board agreed to purchase $25,000 worth of U.S. government loan, quote, if in their judgment the events of the war justify it, unquote. Despite this cautionary note, the board apparently was soon satisfied that the war was going the right way and they voted to buy into the government loan. With the war slowly but steadily showing victory for the Union cause, the bank directors returned to the question of becoming a national bank. President Gibbons spent much time in Harrisburg meeting with state leaders and other bankers. On August the 22nd, 1864, the Pennsylvania legislature passed an enabling act allowing state chartered banks to become national banks. On September the 12th, 1864, the directors called for a meeting of the stockholders to vote on the question. The stockholders met on October 26th of that year and approved the change. On November the 14th, 1864, the bank's board was reorganized with Mr. Gibbons continuing as president and Dr. Charles Houston elected as secretary. Now the changeover to national bank status meant the discontinuation of the old notes the federal banking authorities expected new national banks to recall, recapture, and destroy their local notes as soon as possible. The federal government moved to speed this process by imposing a 10% tax on all state bank notes still in circulation after July the 1st of 1866. And so in January the 2nd, 1865, the board authorized its officers to burn all the issues of the bank in Chester Valley on hand. I must admit I find all these references to burning mother money rather disconcerting, but it was done. <laughs> the centennial history of the bank, issued in 1957, and our good friend brought a copy to show us. This was published for the 100th anniversary. Marion Stoner's connections with the bank were much love, and she brought that for us to see. Um, the centennial history of the bank indicates that more than 200,000 of the bank's notes were burned in the early months of 1865, with additional burnings held in 1866, 1867, and 1874. You can imagine, it was quite a project, calling all these notes in. And it was not until 1881 that all the circulation of the Bank of Chester Valley was finally accounted for, except for a few numbers. So on June the 27th of 1881, the board resolved that all outstanding circulation of the Bank of Chester Valley, which they hadn't called in or haven't gotten, amounting to $1,734, would be credited to profit and loss and considered debt. Thus ended the active history of these notes. Have any of these notes survived? Possibly a few somewhere carefully preserved by collectors or lost in old family files. Certainly none have come to light in recent years to my knowledge, and I certainly hope that we would find some. You will ask then, how did these proof sheets survive and how did we find them? The engraving firm of Bald Causland & Company was eventually absorbed into the American Banknote Company, a firm still in business, I believe, famous for production of stock certificates, bank and other, other uh, securities that require specialized engraving and printing. The files of Bald Causland & Company became the property of the American Banknote Company 
and remained in their collections until some years ago when the American Banknote Company decided to dispose of its historical archives. In September of 1990, a sale of these archives was held in New York City under the auspices of Christian Christie's Auction House. Mr. Thomas Werner, Chester County dealer in rare coins and notes, attended the auction and purchased uh, the Bank of Chester Valley proof sheets. And sometime later, he alerted me to his acquisition. And of course, I was very excited to, to see them and anxious to acquire them for the Greystone Society's collection. There were two or three sets of the proofs, some in simple black and white and others tinted. As we could purchase only one set, I chose the tinted ones, which you see here tonight as being more attractive. And then we had them framed in acid-free paper and glare-proof uh, glass. We were very fortunate. We had to raise quite a bit of money to buy these things. And uh, fortunately, the uh, Lukens Foundation, the Houston Foundation, and PNC Bank, which owned it at the prompt, came through each with a third, and we were able to acquire them. So they're real treasure. And um, as we celebrate and uh, the acquisition of these items, rejoice in their preservation, I think it's important to recognize that they're not merely, merely relics of a long gone past, with no relation to the present. Instead, we see them as telling the story of a successful, ongoing Coastville business institution. We think there is a definite distinction between living in the past and rec recognizing the past. As we appreciate the accomplishments of the past, we strive to learn from it. The Greystone Society, in focusing its attentions and funds on the preservation of local historic artifacts, the restoration of fort and buildings, is doing so with the clear objective of using the legacy of the past for the present and future betterment of this community and the recognition of its industrial heritage, which gave this community its prominence, its prosperity, and its historic presence. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this bit of banking history. And please look around. Again, that is the portrait of Abram Gibbons. These are copies of the original wash drawings that were used on the notes. And these are the proof sheets for the notes. This gentleman is Mr. Mode. Uh, some years ago, the bank gave us a collection of pictures of gentlemen who had been on the board of directors of the bank in the 19th century. And I dug one of them from the files to show. Mr. Mode, for whom Odina came from the Mode family. So that's the end of that. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jean. That was very interesting. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the Stuart Houston Charitable Trust and Coatesville Savings Bank. Uh, we'd like to invite you to see the presentation on uh, line at 3CD, 3ctvlive.com. And uh, please note our upcoming events. We have the uh, Volunteers Day later this month, May 19th, and the Garden Party on June 16th. We'd love to have you come. Thank you all.